Thank you, Chris. Uh, one thing that you note in today's uh, the aesthetics as well as this, the calendar, uh, you, if you are a Christian, you are countercultural and you serve another king. You are fundamentally different because God has reconciled you to himself through his son. His own spirit possesses you. And because of his spirit within you, the, the course of your life is in cross grain with the society in which he has left you. And so children, look, look at me. I joke around with saying it's not Halloween. It's Reformation Day. And we, uh, we do have a little bit of fun in talking about that music, which is hundreds of years old, sounds different. Children, look at me. If you're going to follow Christ, you're going to be different. You're not going to be accepted. You're going to have to make a choice. Either Jesus will be your king and your commander. And you will go the very opposite way that many of your fellow Americans will go. Or you can reject Jesus as king and you can follow the one that they follow, ultimately the devil himself. There's fun in being different, especially when Christ is the one that makes us different. So I josh, but there's a point in the jesting. What I want us to do tonight with the little bit of time that we have is to think about the two kings that are operating in this present sphere, the world as it is. And the king is one, tyrants, and uh, they can be in government. And the other king is the greater king, and he's a savior. So we're going to build, and tonight my aim is to establish just one, one point and three points that we'll cover the next two, uh, uh, tomorrow night, and then finally Sunday morning. So my main aim for tonight is to define the nature of the relationship that both the church and the state have with God. And then that's going to enable us to then develop how we can have some sort of relationship with the state, but it must be modified. There's certain conditions to it. I think it is obvious, uh, some presuppositions, but I just want to make sure that I, I state them explicitly. Number one, I presume that scripture is sufficient for all of life. And relating to government is a part of life. I therefore infer that scripture is sufficient for us to think about politics and how we should relate to the various political authorities that we as Christ's church here have to honor, submit, and when necessary, resist, right? So scripture is sufficient for thinking about politics. Second presupposition, I presume that all of life is connected. That is to say, I reject that life is atomistic, divided into pieces and parts that are separated and disjointed from one another. So I believe that there is connections from state to family, to society, to sexuality, to being a boy or a girl and a man and a woman and marriage and procreation and what you think and what you love and how you act. Uh, we could go on and on and on. I do not believe that there is divisions and parts that make this life disjointed and atomistic 
Rather, it is united and cohesive. If you do not believe that, then we will disagree this weekend. Number three, my third presupposition is, I believe that everything is to be done for the glory of God. God made everything and everyone for his glory. I infer from that everything and everyone exists for the glory of God. Politics, the church, society, families, individual lives, all of this is to be done for the glory of God. So that's an enterprise that we all have, whether you are in political office or whether you are voting or whether you are a member in a church or a father or a mother or a son or a daughter, whatever you may be in station, course, status in life, I think all of it exists for you to give glory to God. If you do not agree with that, then we will not agree to this weekend. And I think consequently, you will not be able to understand the state as you should and then relate to it as you should as a follower of Jesus as your king. All right, so those are just three presuppositions. I challenge you. I challenge you with your presuppositions. What do you assume? about this world and yourself and family and church and nation and God. Right? If we do not consider our presuppositions, it's going to affect our conclusions because it affects what we work with. All right. So those are mine. They're on the table. You see them clearly. And so we can converse about them. I want to uh, lay out the contemporary need that we have as Christ's church to define the relationship that the church has with God and the state has with God so that we then can maybe build the connection between the relationship and responsibilities that will come next probably tomorrow uh, that the church has and that the state has. May 14th, 2020, Channel 12 News reported, quote, North Carolina's governor is standing by his executive order that keeps churches from conducting traditional indoor services amid the coronavirus pandemic. Governor Roy Cooper said he is a church elder and was a Sunday school teacher for more than 20 years and is grateful for his church family and the sense of belonging and community. However, he added that gathering in groups right now is not safe. One fundamental tenet of faith is to care for and love one another. He said, when doing these things together, sitting or standing indoors for more than 10 minutes, we greatly increase the chances of passing to each other a virus that can be deadly. Gratefully, you may remember, and also lawfully, the state Supreme Court struck down this ruling as unconstitutional. But the fact remains that our present governor believed that he had the authority to tell churches how to conduct their worship. California governor, as well as Los Angeles mayor, issued orders for churches to shut down. And when churches like Grace Community Church in Sun Valley, California, continue to worship, both the state and county governments leveled fees and retributive actions. Gratefully and lawfully, the Supreme Court heard Grace Community Church's lawsuit and demanded that the state and county pay to the church, to the church damages and their legal fees. We see states giving orders as if they have authority over the church objectively that is the facts i don't it doesn't matter how we feel toward governor cooper or towards the state of california we also have objectively states are mandating vaccines for their citizens to enjoy constitutionally protected liberties mandatory vaccines have been given from states california is clearly rolling this out in addition federal workers have been commanded to take the vaccine. It does not matter that they may have religious objections to the vaccine. The government has issued that they must comply with this order or suffer consequences. 
despite the fact that our Constitution protects freedom of religion. Another example is that the state refuses to protect freedom of religion as it is applied to business practices. You may recall a funeral home director in Ohio fired a man who was his employee because this man was hired not only because he was born with his sex on his birth certificate being male, but he dressed consistent with his sex. But this employee then decided that no longer would he act consistent with his sex, and so started showing up to work at the funeral home dressed as a woman. The business owner of the funeral home fired this employee, and the employee took him to court. The Supreme Court heard the case, and you might remember that the high court sided with the employee who was fired, citing the Civil Rights Act of 1964, now defining sex, not as male or female at the point of birth, but rather by the gender you identify with. You may also recall recently a florist refused to do floral arrangements for a same-sex so-called marriage ceremony due to her Christian faith. She was sued, ultimately appealed to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court did not hear her case. All of that is objective evidence that freedom to practice your religion in the sphere of business is not protected in our nation. The state presently refuses to protect, enforce what the Constitution grants to citizens of the United States of America, and that is freedom of religion, not freedom of worship, freedom of religion. Now, I could go on and talk about the uh, restriction of freedom of religion in religious adoption services. We could go on to talk about the state sanctioning immorality as righteousness by saying homosexual unions are legally sanctioned marriages, that abortion is protected as health care, that states are now sanctioning immorality through health education, that states are protecting sexual rebellion of children even from their parents, right? On and on and on, we could illustrate not with feelings, but with objective actions from the government. All of which has, at least for me for the last two years, illustrated I need to sharpen up. I, I confess that I was not anticipating such actions, at least so quickly. All of these now need to be associated that the church has clearly illustrated that we are not clear-minded either. Evangelical Protestants have illustrated a great deal of confusion, or maybe even worse, a lack of courage. We have churches that have remained in practical disobedience to Christ's commands in the New Testament by refusing to gather for in-person services and come to the Lord's table. Churches have even criticized other churches for their gatherings in obedience to Christ's commands. When Grace Community Church's elders issued on a Friday afternoon, or I think it might have been like just before noon on a Friday afternoon, Jonathan Lehman of Capitol Hill Baptist, he's no longer of Capitol Hill Baptist, he's of nine marks, he then broke with the normal protocol and they released a, a podcast on Saturday just to make sure that they could disagree with Grace Community Church's elders' stance. It's fine that men can disagree and make arguments for it, but to call into question churches obeying the Lord Jesus' commands seems incredibly suspicious. 
Confessing evangelical Christians have had an uncritical disposition towards the government's orders, often citing Romans 13 as the reason that they will obey the government and disobey Scripture's commands. Pastors of large prominent congregations such as J.D. Greer of the Summit Church and the Raleigh-Durham Triangle area have chosen to yield leadership that they have as the leaders of the churches so that they shut down church for the remainder of 2020. All of this is to illustrate objectively with decisions, concrete actions, responses of church leaders of how they are are thinking and reacting to what the government has been doing when the word of God commands us to do certain things. This, to me, illustrates that there is need, maybe not for you, but I have found it helpful to revisit the nature of of relationships of state and church But the first, and this is all we'll cover tonight, the first nature in this relationship that we need to understand is not the church's relationship to the state and the state's relationship to the church, but what is the state's relationship to God and the church's relationship to God, which is also going to touch on what is the nature of your relationship with God, your family's relationship with God. And so my main point for tonight is just to say that both church and state are covenantly bound to obey God's law for both church and state are in covenantal relationships to God. Every state Every government ordered by human society is bound to God in a covenant relationship like every church and every Christian in the church is bound to God in a covenant relationship. The name of the relationship we find in Scripture that binds every state to God is called the noetic covenant. I'd like for you to turn to Genesis. Genesis Genesis is called the book of beginnings. And for us to understand our world, our place, society, state, laws, punishment, family, we, we we have to see the world through the lens that Genesis gives us. Once again, this is why the book of Genesis, the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, are critical for the church to indeed understand, as the church has always understood, that God inspired these words. These words are not fables. They are not myths. These words tell us the actual history of how creation came to be and the nature of the relationships in creation. And in Genesis 9, we are going to hit a particular point that God establishes a covenant with all creation. And here we will see that the nature of the state's relationship, this includes the United States of America, this includes the state of North Carolina, This would include the local government, New Bern's aldermen, the mayor. This would include our county commissioners, right? In this way, I'm saying everywhere there is a a lawful state that has authorities, government, that government, is this true for the monarchy of England, that their government is in this covenantal relationship with God that that is determined by the noetic covenant. In chapter 9, this is after God has destroyed all humanity, all creeping things, and saved Noah, his wife, his three sons, their wives. 
God in chapter 9 blesses, look at verse 1, he blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That is a restatement of what God commanded Adam and Eve to do before the fall in the Garden of Eden. Verse 2, the fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky with everything that creeps and on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is its blood. Surely I will require your life blood from every beast. I will require it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will, will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. As for you, be fruitful and multiply, populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. Then God spoke to Noah and his sons with him, saying, Now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you. Of all that comes out of the ark, even every beast of the earth, I establish my covenant with you and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood. Neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant, which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations. I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow will be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Now, you notice that here, like in all of the covenants God makes, there are stipulations. There is an arrangement. And God is the one who determines the arrangements. But God is also the one who determines the nature of the relationship. And the nature of the relationship is not contractual. Most Americans who think secularly and atomistically, that means in parts, may have at best an understanding of the government's relationship to any other person as a societal contract. That is not what Scripture teaches us. Governments, societies, are bound to relate to God according to the covenant nature and stipulations of the noetic covenant. That is why, what should we do with animals when our stomach growls? Kill and eat. Because God no longer gives the green plants as he did to Adam. Now, after the noetic covenant, all animals are ours to sustain us. So we eat meat. Likewise, what is demanded, whether it be of man or of beast, who takes a man's life, a woman's life, a boy's life, a girl's life? What is required according to the noetic covenant that God establishes for all humanity? Is there, I'm sorry. I'm going to raise my voice like I'm preaching, but I'm actually trying to have a class. <laughs> What's required? Blood. And by blood, what does that mean? Death. That's called capital punishment in our society. If a society refuses, if a government refuses to execute capital punishment for capital crimes, 
They are in violation, not only with the citizens that understand the responsibilities of the government, they are in violation of the God who demanded that they repay with capital punishment a man or a woman, a boy or a girl or a beast that takes a man or woman, boy or girl's life. This is not something that God leaves up to kings and queens and, and, and governing bodies of societies to determine. God establishes the nature of the covenant relationship in the noetic covenant, and it is the obligation of human society to conform to God's stipulations of this covenant. Now, God also says very clearly, what will God do in this covenant relationship? God, God has, he will not destroy all humanity. He will not destroy all the beasts of the field. He will not destroy by way of flood. Right? So this relationship is covenantal in nature, not contractual. Our governments, like all governments, are bound to the noetic covenant. We cannot imagine that the nature of the state's relationship with God is such that they get to volunteer how they are going to act towards God and how they are going to delegate their duties and responsibilities to their citizens to which they have authority over. No, they are obligated to keep the, the noetic covenant. And where there is failure to keep what God demands in the noetic covenant, then God rightfully is going to bring a judgment against them. Now, this also touches on a, just a principle that I think we need to communicate, and that is, is that all of society is covenantal in nature. All of society is in covenant, is covenantal in nature. And that covenant is between them and God them and their neighbor. And in this case, we see it's also between us and creation. So the noetic covenant was a covenant that was not only made with man, but with all creatures and creation. You can think about other relationships that clearly establish this, but we also see God treats Gentile nations according to his character and his judgment. This is a quick can anybody think of a Gentile nation that God shows up and announces judgment is impending upon them for their sins? All right, so Sodom and Gomorrah was sort of like a, like a city just there, but there was a, what? Assyria. There's one that has its own, has two books. Two books. What? No. Nope. Nineveh. Oh. Uh, Good answer. Nineveh, you got it in the back. All right. We, we definitely know the story of Jonah. But do you also know Nahum was written to Nineveh too? Now, I just want to take you to Nahum just because there is an echo of God's character that I want you to see. First, before we get there, we're going to make a stop in Exodus chapter 34. So Exodus chapter 34, e Exodus 34, this, uh, this follows Israel in chapter 19 is offered a covenant relationship with God. Israel is told what's, what is required in this covenant and what do they receive in the covenant, and they agree. And so they, they enter into covenant with God, and in chapter 20, that's when we get the Ten Commandments, the beginning and the summation of the law. They are then given the law. So quick reminder, do you enter into covenant relationship with God by keeping the law? No, never happened, all right? Rather, because you are in covenant relationship with God, you get his law. And so he gives, he gives law to, to Israel after they enter into covenant. And uh, we read about that in chapter 20. Well, this is, they've, they've already broken the covenant. And Moses in chapter 34, he, he goes up, he is, uh, he's given the stones. And this is, 
This is the second time he goes up. The covenant has to be renewed because Israel has already broken the covenant before Moses can even get down from Sinai the first time. But so now in starting in verse 10, we see that the covenant is renewed. But while Moses is there, God preaches to Moses in his presence about himself. That is, God preaches about God to Moses. And this is what God says to Moses about himself. This is verse 6. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship all right so you see what god says about himself to moses now i want you to turn over to nahum all right in nahum we are going to see what does god say to Nineveh, not Israel, Nineveh, the oracle of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite, a jealous and avenging God is the Lord. Notice the Lord is the same as what God said to Moses, the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And the whirlwind and the storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He goes on to talk about it. Do, do, do you see that God has the covenant obligation not only to punish Israel, his covenant nation, when they violate the, the noetic covenant, God also has the obligation to punish pagan nations like Nineveh when they violate what God is, obligates them to. What this establishes for us is that when we think about any nation's government, it is in a covenantal relationship with the Lord such that he holds them responsible for their actions and will punish them according to his will. Thus, church, we need to reckon with the fact that our, our nation has a king over it. Our state has a king over it. Our White House has a king over it. And the king over our nation, no matter what our nation says, is the Lord. This is the covenantal nature that governments have with God, because God has stipulated the noetic covenant. Implications for us as we think about the state is that whether or not a nation submits to God or not, they are under his rule and accountable to him. Another implication is that all human societies are covenantally bound to God the creator. No matter what Albania says, there actually is not an atheistic nation because God is sovereign over all nations. Human societies are covenantal in nature, covenanted with God, covenanted with their fellow citizens as their neighbor, and even a consequence of the covenant in, in creation. Consequently, failure to keep the covenant obligations of the noetic covenant brings divine judgment upon the society. Now, this is something that uh, 
God has already stipulated in his character. What will God by no means do? We just read it. Leave the guilty unpunished. That includes states, not only individual human beings. I'd like to show you that this is manifested. We see it in Nahum, but I want you to see the Apostle Paul to talk about principally what happens with peoples as they do this. And you'll see in Romans 1 verses 18 through 32, the downward spiral of heathens. Paul is talking about people who do not have the law. They do not have access to Israel, to the gospel. And he talks about how they are given revelation from God, not sufficient for salvation, but sufficient for condemnation. And he talks about how they respond. And it is a downward spiral of ongoing sin. But please notice, and I'm going to emphasize these words, God is presently judging them. Starting in verse 18, please notice, for the wrath, for the wrath of God is revealed. So is that coming? No, it's here. It's present. This is the, the description of God's wrath in the presence against these heathens. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. I call that conscience. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. That is, perception of creation in cooperation with the divine gift of conscience leads them to know there is a God. And how do they respond? Paul continues, for even though, verse 21, they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Notice, does their repro sort of increased immorality, does it sort of remain within them? When God is revealing judgment upon those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, does the judgment of being given over to their sin, does it just sort of stay within their mind, within their hearts, within their bodies, or does it affect others? Well, it affects others, right? When God presently judges sinners, it doesn't stay within that sinner. It has a community effect because our human beings, covenantal beings, are not. Are they atomistic or communal beings, relational beings? They are covenantal communal beings. So when God gives one over to their sin, it has effects on society. It does not remain within them. Notice what continues to happen. Verse 34, therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts, of the lust of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creator rather than the, I'm sorry, the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with women committing indecent acts and receiving, I'm sorry, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind 
to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they knew the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. What is the ultimate consequence of God giving one over to their sin as his punishment? What's the bottom, so to speak? Verse 32. How do you know a society has hit bottom? What? Endorses evil as good. So let's just give a reminder about our state. Our government declares abortion the murder of human beings in the womb to be lawfully protected as a reproductive right. Our society declares that if a man wants to marry a man, the federal government has issued that every state must honor that as legal marriage. Our Government has issued that if, if, a, if a man or a boy wants to act like he is a girl or a woman, or a, a girl or a woman wants to act as if she is a boy or a man, our state has declared that to be a civil right. That civil rights are good, right? So do you see American Christian? There is absolutely no basis for us to imagine that God has not given our nation over to his judgment. We are covenantally bound to him according to the noetic covenant, and we have refused to keep those stipulations. God has given us up. This is the nature of the state. This is true not only for the United States of America, this is true for all nations, all states, all counties. We therefore, as we think about the state in relationship to God, which is a covenant relationship, we need to understand the only solution to deal with breaches and covenants is not you know, sinatoning works. It's repentance. What does Psalm 2, where is it? What does Psalm 2 demand of the nations? Kiss the son. Take refuge in him, right? See, the, the necessary understanding that we as a church are to have in relationship to our state is that we're not going to prescribe to our state a system of works so that they might dig themselves out of the pit that their sin and rebellion has put them in. It is rather that we are to understand God calls for repentance. God calls states to repent. Psalm 2. But we do have to reckon, Christian, where in our society should our state, all of our societal neighbors, where should they be able to look and see, oh, that's what repentance looks like? Because all of society is bound through covenant relationships, not just the state. Our families are bound in covenant relationship. Our church. We are bound in covenant relationship with Christ in the new covenant. The portal for states to see the necessary response is us. The living, active 
life of repentance and faith in the church. And so I want to end with this. We need to understand that the nature of the state's relationship with God is covenantal. And I believe there is objective reason, though I do not know the mind of God, but in the word of God, it is very clear. The evidence for God giving a society up to their sins by declaring evil good and good evil has settled on our nation. The call is for repentance. The church is to be the voice and the moving picture of what repentance to God looks like. And so we should ask ourselves, have we repented of our sin and our covenantal relationships of marriage and family and church? And so I think we have to realize that, Brian, we will have to call tyrants, tyrants when necessary. A tyrant is not only a person, a tyrant can be an actual government, but we need also to recognize tyranny can exist in our own hearts. Husbands can look at their wives and see that their wives exist for them to be able to exploit such that they gratify their selfish desires instead of serve for the benefit in love. the woman who is indeed one flesh. Wives likewise can break the covenant that God has given to her, to her husbands, demanding that wives honor their husbands. And yet wives, if you do not honor your husbands, if you not revere them as God has commanded you to do in the covenant of marriage, we better not call our government the tyrants who need to be addressed when we are tyrants in our own covenants relationships of marriage likewise fathers and mothers if we had time we were going to look at ephesians 6 but you see there fathers in this relationship that god has stipulated with our children we are not to exasperate them we're to discipline them we are to instruct them they are not burdens they are the very purpose to receive this kind of intensive instruction and love and yet if we are not faithful to that covenant obligation to our children we don't need to cry tyranny about the state likewise children you need to understand god has bound you covenantally to your mother and to your father such that if you dishonor your mother and father boys you better listen to me right now you dishonor your mama with your smart mouth you disrespect her you are breaking God's command for you to receive his blessing. The fifth commandment is the first commandment with the promise that it will go well with you on the earth. Do not, do not dishonor your mama. Do not dishonor your father. Esteem them highly. Right? We cannot cry tyranny about the state when tyranny rules in the covenant relationship of marriage and family. Likewise, the church is bound through the new covenant relationship that Christ has written with his own blood. If there are divisions in the church that the blood of Christ is not able to sufficiently cover and to restore because grace is sought and mercy is given. We do not need to cry tyranny about the government. We need to make sure that tyranny doesn't rule in our hearts and tyranny doesn't rule in our homes and tyranny doesn't rule in the church house. Before we say anything, about the secular state being tyrants. And so in this way, let judgment, as Scripture clearly tells us, it begins in the household of God. So I think I wrote to you in the weekly Berean about uh, the longer catechism. If you don't have it, you can uh, pull it up or I'll give it to you. There's a very helpful consideration of considering the principle of the fifth commandment in these relationships. And so I'm going to end with a little time. It's just going to be quiet. 
of where we just can consider these covenant relationships of marriage and family and church and ask God to convict us and to encourage us to be faithful to him, to confess our sins, to turn from them, seek forgiveness, restoration there before we move on for the rest of the weekend and think about understanding the duties and responsibilities of the state and the church. After that, we're going to uh, open up some questions, and then we can mill about for a little while. Join me in prayer.